Good morning, everybody. Um, well, that's all the nice things that Nicole's talked about. I guess I can kind of fill in um, the messier things. So I, I've, I've probably been working in and around the Republic of Everyone now for around about 10 years. So there was this sort of weird moment in time where I just moved from um, into Sydney from Canberra. I didn't really know what to do with myself. Um, I think I, my first job in Sydney was working as a marketing assistant at Allen and Unwin um, Books, and I hated it. It was the worst job ever. So I basically bullshitted my way into a job with Oxfam, which was much better. Um, and then from there, went to a place called Climate Friendly around the time that this um, whole carbon offset thing was a thing. Remember that? The carbon off? Yeah, it's gone along with the emissions trading scheme. Um, and so the first one of, um, I was actually, the, so Climate Friendly was one of Republic of Everyone's first ever clients and they um, helped out with a rebrand. And that's how I got to meet Ben Peacock, um, who's wonderful, and a guy called Matt, who is equally as wonderful, but no longer part of um, Republic of Everyone. And they were a couple of ad guys, um, kind of mid midlife crisis. Ben had just, um, he just, re he was in recovery from um, testicular cancer, and Matt had had just had children, and was basically, I think both of them were in that kind of um, period in their careers where they were just like, why am I selling crap that people don't need to pay, you know, anything? So, but they came with this, like, I suppose, incredible array of skills, having worked in professional communications for a really long time. Um, at the same time, I was involved in quite a lot of, like, rat bag activism. So this is me. Um, I, yeah. <laughs> it feels like quite a long time ago. It was actually quite a long time ago. Um, but I, I think... I can't even remember how I fell into this group of people. I think it was through a friend I met in Brazil. And, and so when I moved to Sydney, I didn't know a lot of people. And I started hanging out with these um, very incredible and inspiring um, grassroots activists who focused mostly on um, coal mining. And so we ran this um, program that was inspired by a lot of work in Europe called Climate Camp. And it was based on the principle of nonviolent direct action. Um, we were really frustrated that there was nothing happening on climate change and so we took it upon ourselves to um, demonstrate our frustration through nonviolent direct action and really, you know, just going, well, you can kind of, you know, buy as many bloody offsets as you want through Qantas, but actually shutting down a coal mine for even a day, like, just, you know, basically will offset your life because it means that there is literally um, shiploads of coal that doesn't get burnt. And one of the really interesting things about working on climate camp was that you had to work together, um, very collaborative over five days to erect almost an entire kind of community that could provide water, electricity, food, and achieve a very common objective um, over a five day period. And I guess that sort of, in a way, if I could recommend any kind of, um, professional development opportunity, I would honestly recommend trying to do that because after experiencing that kind of um, level of, um, I suppose, um, coordination out of sheer necessity and also working with no resources or budget, it's kind of good to be able to walk into any job and say, hey, um, I can do all of these things and I can also do it without any money. Like, no, 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 no. So in a way, that was quite appealing to Ben and Matt because they're like, oh, what, what do you mean? You can, like, you don't need an ad spend? And I'm like, no, 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 if it's interesting enough, um, there are all these free tools that you can use to get your message across and galvanise community and, and work together. So that was quite, that was quite appealing to them and that they've, thereby sort of started the whole relationship with Republic of Everyone. And I think in the time that I've worked with those guys, my job titles changed, you know, like every couple of years, just depending on um, what's happening and what they think they can do with me, which is, it's, yeah, I've done quite a few things there. So, but that's not what we're really here to talk about. We're, talk, we're here to talk about um, equality today. And um, in a way, I think I like drew 
a pretty crappy straw because of all the things you have to talk about. This one's really hard. And I don't think um, that's... No, it's OK, Nicole. Like, I kind of agreed. Um, but it's something that I've really, really had to think about. And I generally... I do think about things most of the time, but I really had to think about this one. And so I kind of came to the conclusion there's actually no such thing as equality. Which, you know, it's a bit of a Debbie Downer position to take. Um, but it's, I think, when we talk about equality, it's often something that people ask you whether you believe in it. They say, it's not like, do you have equality? Have you attained equality? They say, do you believe in equality? So I think it sort of has this equivalent status to say, you know, religion or unicorns or um, like hangover free wine and maybe even the National Broadband Network. <laughs> it's a nice concept. We all would like to believe in it, but whether it actually exists, yeah, um, it's a bit of a, a, a bit of a, a noble aspiration, really. Um, and so, like all kind of things, you don't really know the answer to. You generally, like mine, prevalent. I just go and ask somebody smarter and see what they think. And it's quite interesting when you ask different people what they think about equality, because I asked two white men, and they have very different ideas of what equality means. Um, to say women or people of colour or people of different socioeconomic backgrounds. So it's one of those things, I think, that is very personal and very context-specific. So I asked a couple of white guys, I asked a couple of women, um, but then I just asked Wikipedia because, let's face it, everybody asks Wikipedia. And this is, this is the actual working definition. Um, it's about the state of being equal in status, right or opportunity and a symbolic representation of the fact that two quantities are equal, so an, an equation. Um, and I suppose in reflection on the types of the work that you do, you go, well, have I experienced equality? Do I practice equality? Does the work that I am involved with contribute to it? Or is it just a bunch of unicorn fart? We don't know. Um, and I, I guess also in the process of thinking about equality, I kept, like, in the back of my mind, I found it really, really hard to separate it from this idea of fairness. And this song just kept ringing in my head. What about me? going to hate me all day for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's, it's really hard to, um, you know, we've got this Shannon Knowles, who can forget him, a privileged, wealthy white man who may or may not have assaulted a stripper up in Queensland. Um, you know, he feels inequality too, doesn't he? And he feels a real deep in, the, in his bosom. And he wants to know, what about me? It's the question we're all asking ourselves. And the question that I'm asking the mouse. Here we go. So, with Shannon Mole, well, Shannon Mole, Shannon Noll <laughs> in mind, I went, okay, is it, is it about fairness? What about me? Um, so I just went, okay, well, I'm just going to start writing a list of all the things that are not equal. And if you can think of something else that you don't think is equal, just feel free to raise your hand or shout it out. So what's not equal? So marriage is obviously not equal in this country. That's a bit crap, isn't it? Um, salaries are not equal. Opportunities are not equal, depending on where you're born, how you're born, who you're born to. Rights are not equal. Wealth is not equal. Home ownership is not equal. Boobs are not equal. <laughs> Access is not equal, whether it be to transport, to housing, to education, to really basic things is not equal. Education is not equal. Influence is not equal. Status is not equal. 80s haircuts are not equal. Corporations are not equal. Political parties are not equal. Plate sizes are not equal. <laughs> what, are, what is equal? 
This is all I could think of. That is equal. That crappy thing you put in your coffee, that is equal. Um, so from that, you go, oh, God, well, how do we handle this overt prevalence of inequality that effectively imbues our whole entire lives just like a really crappy excuse for sugar? How do we deal with that? And it's kind of this untenable thing where sometimes if you think about it too hard and if you make it too much of your mission, like of it, too much of your mission to deal with, I think you often feel like sort of Sisyphus pushing the rock up the hill only to have it kind of fall back on you again and again and again. You can be, it can be a little bit heartbreaking and frustrating. Um, and there are a lot of people, I think, luckily, who are fighting for different parts of equality. But what I really wanted to do is um, share with you this sort of other option where you can, I guess you can battle inequality by being really mad about it and, you know, there's something come up on your Facebook feed and you're like, oh, this is fucked. And you go, yeah, yeah, it really is. And then you're like, okay, well, let's get on with things. Um, you, can, you can also um, ignore it and just go, well, that's just the way it is and there's nothing I can do about it, whatever. Um, but I I'm, I'm kind of take comfort in science and in particular um, the second rule of thermodynamics. So this is going to be a bit of a journey. Just hang with me here. So the second rule of thermodynamics is entropy. The technical, um, where's my slide? The technical um, definition of entropy is the thermodynamic quantity representing the unavailability of a system's thermal energy for conversion into mechanical work, often interpreted as the degree of disorder or randomness in the system. Comprende? <laughs> yeah, no. Okay. So basically, it's a comforting idea that says that the natural state of things is not meant to be equal, is that everything around us is effectively um, random and unpredictable and always sort of in this, this ongoing state of flux. So it's a comfort to me because it means that we're not constantly aspiring to this thing that is completed and that is fair and that is finished. In fact, the more that we do that, the more there's, also, there's, a, is a, there's an adverse effect. So in terms of entropy, like this is sort of, this sort of demonstrates it in a, in a very simple way. So if your mission is to create order, so say you um, have all your clothes and you order them very nicely in your wardrobe and they're all lovely and it, it, we all know that it only takes a matter of sometimes minutes before those clothes end up in their natural state <laughs> on the bedroom floor. Um, it's also this idea that, say, if I had like a big clutch of sticks in my hand, I'm a system, I'm an entropic system, the sticks are an entropic system. As I hold them in my hand, they're at their highest potential energy. There's a whole lot of things that could happen to those sticks at that moment. I could like piff them in someone's face, I could throw them over there, I could eat them. There's a whole series of possibilities of what could happen with those sticks. But at the moment that I drop them, there's a, you have a bit of an idea of what's going to happen. They're going to fall to the floor, but you can never know with absolute certainty where those sticks will end up. And by those sticks falling to their lowest potential energy, inadvertently, I've created more opportunities within the system because those sticks are now a system unto themselves. There are multiple things that could happen. Somebody could pick them up, somebody could throw it back at me, somebody could chuck them out the window, anything could happen. But I've also released the potential energy from those level of sticks. We're getting deep, aren't we? Okay. Are we following a little bit? I'm not, a, I'm not a physicist, so. Um, so I guess the lesson in entropy is that we spend a lot of time attempting to create order. Um, we create systems, we hang our clothes up, we try and aspire to this sort of finish point, but we can let ourselves off the hook a little bit if we acknowledge that the system is inherently chaotic and there are multiple um, 
forces at work all of the time. And that means that there are also multiple opportunities and opportunities for interventions, which is really, really, really conducive to creativity. So if you can forget the way that everything ought to be and the way that you would like to imagine those things to be, that gives you almost limitless possibilities creatively in terms of the work that you do. I don't think, oh yeah, so chaos and disorder is more natural and creative state. So that's kind of the point, embrace it, as opposed to trying to be really hard on yourselves. Um, I find it quite, like on an emotional level, I find that embracing this kind of thinking um, kind of helps me cope a little bit with all of the stuff that I get really angry about all the time. And it kind of gets me out of my little nosy predilections. And it's like, what about me? It's not fair. Like it sort of helps me quell that kind of, um, that anger. Um, and I also think that it sort of, it highlights yeah, and I guess I've also, in retrospect, used it in a lot of work because if I, if I thought, like, so if I thought that recycling was something that you could only deal with by everybody doing the right thing and putting the right thing in the right bin, it probably wouldn't have um, led me to wonder how else might we fix this problem and what kind of other narrative-based tools or trickery could we use um, to, to deal with that problem. Um, similarly with Grow It Local, I guess, um, and maybe the theory behind Grow It Local and I guess the theory that our agency adopts more broadly is how can you use trickery to convince people to do things you want them to do without them knowing that they're doing them. But the exception in our agency is that we make them do good things, not bad things. So, you know, kind of like the idea of the... Um, the Trojan horse of fun, you know, and I suppose like um, reflecting on activist stuff and, and being so upset that it's not fair that the government doesn't care about all of the polluting things that are going into the atmosphere. Um, trying to influence change from that point of view gets really tired. Um, and it doesn't always work and it's not a great deal of fun. So the alternative to that is that um, you can sidestep that entire conversation if you can kind of infiltrate a, a bigger bubble or a bigger campaign or a bigger offer with all those issues. Because when you start like yelling at people about what they should or shouldn't do, um, they'll either respond in one of two ways. They'll fight you on the facts. They'll be like, that's bullshit, that's not true, blah, 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 climate change doesn't exist. You know, the, of course, everything in the bin gets recycled. Don't be ridiculous. Human rights, whatever. Um, I like my three dollar t-shirt. Um, but I suppose, and or they'll, or they'll actually, they'll fight you on the facts, or they'll take flight from the issue completely. So they'll be like, you know what, this is too much. I'm just going to go home and watch Game of Thrones, which is a reasonable thing for people to do. So the Trojan horse of fun is about um, having, like, sidestepping all of those issues by sending in something else that people actually want to do. So in the case of Grow It Local, Grow It Local is a Trojan horse of fun. The issues within that Trojan horse are food security, um, community connectivity, um, composting to an extent, and local food systems and food economies. So I'll just show you really quickly what um, we did for TEDx. Um, and then I guess we're kind of almost at question time. The idea of crowd farming was to ask everyone who came to TEDx Sydney to grow the food that we would eat on the day. My God, 2,200 people. What is involved is, is a massive operation. On Saturday, I'll probably be starting my career, actually. To the best of my knowledge, no one's ever attempted anything on this scale before. No one's been stupid enough to attempt anything of this magnitude before. 
The whole idea of the crowd farming came from that initiative by Grow It Local. Well, Grow It Local is all about encouraging backyard, balcony, community and windowsill farmers. It doesn't matter where you live, how much space you have. You can register your patch, your garden. Even if you have five tomatoes or, you know, 20 chilies. Lettuce, purple basil, one by one. Marjoram. The backyarders, the balconies, they were the first. This is our house in Earlwood. We're in Redfern. I'm in Leichhardt. 13th floor of an apartment block in Potts Point. And we're bringing our nasturtiums to TEDx Sydney. The fun part was then talking to Aria Catering. The chefs are not going to know what they're getting until like Thurs the Thursday, Friday. That's where it gets a bit interesting. Pressure is on, I know that. How are you feeling? Anxiety. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> We're in neutral bay. The neighbours don't know that I have beehives, no. 150,000 worker bees creating the honey that you're eating today. And they don't even have to be paid. As it grew, we started wondering, well, what about meat? You know, we don't have cows in backyards. What about milk and bread? But it just happened organically that people got in touch with us and said, what do you want? An arm, a leg, a pig, anything. TEDx, do you want to get involved? We're there. First time ever to put a mill inside the Opera House. We're going to be milling, we're going to be shaping the bread, we're going to be baking it, and you're going to be eating it. We're supplying the butter for the day. Made that morning, churned that morning, handmade. The cream is local, full flavour. They're going to experience something quite incredible. All the milk that's in your coffees, straight from the care. The beef lovingly raised and taken care of. So it's about using the whole animal. Absolutely. Yeah. All grass fed, all naturally grown. We'll dry age this just in time for Ted. Because Ted's coming for dinner. Ted's coming for, <laughs> Ted's coming for dinner on the 4th of May. Well, we're the only people in Australia who do organic wagyu, sympathetic to the environment, with considerations for the welfare of the animal. And with all this great food, you'll need something to wash it down. Australian pale ale is what we've aimed for. This is it, the TEDx fresh hop ale. All the hop flavour is from locally grown hops. We're in Oatley and I grow hops in my backyard. Swapped it for some beer, which is, uh, which is great. A little bit of Sydney, a very nice beer. Well, here we are a week out from the event and we're just gathering our honey from the hives that have been in the Royal Botanic Gardens. We're supplying hopefully about 20 kilos of honey completely unprocessed, it'll just be spray out of the frames and the honey tastes amazing. We're heading off to the Muscats family farm, we're getting rhubarb from there and that's what we're using to make the rhubarb jam. We're here tonight at the Jammin' and Jammin' workshop. Jam it, pickle it and chutney it. Give it to people to eat at TEDx, that's what it's about. Oh, sleepy, sleepy. So we're like seven sleeps till TEDx. It's, an, it's a slightly awkward tension between um, Simon and myself. Every week he's kind of like, so do you know what we're getting? It's been a hard one this has, so I'm not going to deny. It's been a logistical... It's not a catastrophe, it's a mystery. It's fine. Today I got on a train at six o'clock this morning to bring a 25 kilo suitcase of rainbow carrots, Nicola potatoes and 5k of Ruby Lou potatoes. We hand farm, uh, we're not mechanical. We're three days out now and you know we're just getting things coming and coming you know every hour now. Potatoes. People should always look to eat local when they can. More and more people all the time are questioning where their food comes from. It's about the people and the growers, um, and ultimately they're the heroes of the whole thing. I put my produce. Wow, rhubarb jam, it doesn't get any better than that. It, it, it's a sense of community, you know, all of this. Some lemon verbena. Sage. It's a Saturday. So this is going to be pretty radical, like this is, I think people are going to lose it just quietly get so excited that you know they, they may not go back into the talks they may just sit out there and stuff themselves with bread all afternoon and that's okay <laughs> you can tell that that video is dedicated because i had lots of hair and then oscar and richard from young hair henry hardly had any have you seen those guys lately they've got heaps of hair um so I guess, yeah, so bringing it back to a quality entropy and a 
avoiding getting too angry and disheartened when things aren't the way they should be. I think that sort of this this sort of Trojan horse of fun thing kind of works for us as a creative outlet and as a means through which we can affect more equality. Um, and I suppose also one of one of the things that entropy kind of tells us is that the greater the in, the inequality within the natural system, the greater the energy because this is a third thermodynamic rule. The greater the energy there is to correct it. So we see that over history, whenever there's been times where there's been incredible, incredible inequality, there's always been an equivalent force that will, will overcome that in one way or another. And I think that that's what we're starting to see with some of the, the really intense inequality that we're seeing in Australia. So I think despite the fact that um, particularly like sitting on council, you get confronted with inequality a lot, um, you know, West Connects in particular drives me absolutely crazy. If you don't know about it, you uh, you should. It's it's horrifying and it's not fair, and it will continue to be not fair since forever. Um, but that can really get you down. So I suppose trying to find the balance in in your own field of influence is something that's really important. Um, so I guess before I I move off, um, I'll leave you with this is what probably one of my favourite quote from. Um, Ed Gillespie and it's about if you want to subvert the dominant par paradigm you have to have more fun than they do and you have to let them know why you're doing it. Um, and while I guess there's that element of fun that's really fantastic it's also really important not to give up the little bit of nosy fight as well. So on that note I hope that your weekend um, has a little bit of both and I apologise about the earworm and leave you with that question, which is, you know, in terms of equality, it's really about what you want to do about it within your very specific realm. So thanks. <laughs> question time. Okay, so the first question is, what other ways are there to promote, like, what free ways can you use to promote stuff? Yeah, like yeah. That, how did you promote that particular campaign? Yeah, I guess, um, I guess with ideas like Grow Local and the garage sale and stuff, it, it, you kind of, it has to be a cracker idea at the beginning. So it has to pass the agency test of like, why would I care, why would I share? So you know when sometimes you're like your whole team will be working on an idea for ages and you think it's got heaps of social legs and it's get, gonna get heaps of pickup and then you kind of um, email it to the rest of the agency and you go, and there's like crickets and you go, oh shit. Um, I think it's that, like I think it's sort of like doing a lot of that experimenting and then sometimes when you've got an idea, you just know in your gut that it makes sense and there's an elegance and so with Grow It Local, I think it was one of those things where it was like, it's also quite out outlandish. Like the, the bigger and more bizarre you make an idea, the more people are just kind of interested because they're like, oh, you're not gonna, really? Like what, you're gonna, you know, crowd farm for 2,000 people? That's ridiculous. So I think there's a lot of legs and talkability in the absurd and the very ambitious and just the elegance of a, a simple, but idea that people actually just want to do, like tapping into what people are naturally inclined to do. And like with Garage Sale Trail, like we don't even, um, you know, and I haven't been involved in it now for years, but still nobody ever talks about waste. It's brilliant. Like you just say, hey, how do you feel about, you know, one day of the year, everybody comes together, you can get rid of your old stuff, have a party, or you can go shopping and bag a bargain. Like you don't even have to talk about waste. You do to the councils that pay for it because um, they want to know, like, you know, what, how it's affecting their bottom line. But, yeah, that's sort of... So that does that answer the question a little bit? And then the other part of the question was about... Apart from fun, are there any other tools you can use to inspire collective action? Apart from fun, are there any other tools you can use to inspire collection, collective action? Um, yes. The bit that I was going to show you that I didn't show you was about integral theory. And I think that integral theory draws upon... Um, 
a lot of principles of traditional advertising, but also incorporates it into a more collective approach. So integral theory sort of, you know, you can always tell people what's good for them in a rational way, um, but you have to do that in conjunction with demonstration. So with cycling, for example, it's like, you know what, cycling makes you fit and healthy, but the overwhelming fear of, am I gonna die? sometimes overrides those feelings so you then have to you then have to kind of demonstrate people and the city of sydney does this very well so you demonstrate in the park you get people to get on a bike and you just say can you ride from that side of the park to that side of the park and sometimes it's the first time they've done it in 20 years and it's just like product demonstration in car dealerships like you can get someone to sit in the car they've bought the bloody car most of the time anyway um, but then you also have to add that to, um, you have to change that perception from the individual to the collective, from perception to reality. And so you can also, if you can add in um, a narrative and show other people doing it, that's really valuable. So the perception that cycling is just for, you know, grey blokes in lycra um, can be overcome by showing a bunch of cute teenage girls, you know, in just normal clothes on cute bikes. Um, but then the other really important thing is the enabling. So that's providing the infrastructure. So separated cycle lanes and, you know, the hardcore stuff. So I think part of it, it yeah, it, it has, it, part of it's about fun, but those elements, that integral theory stuff is quite important too. Yeah. Who was the other guy? Oh yeah. What's, what, 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 how do I practice self-deception? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think you just get on with it. Uh, maybe it's a little bit of avoidance. Um, I don't know, I think there are some things that, I mean, it's not difficult. Like, I've chosen to do things that I care about because I couldn't imagine not doing things that I didn't care about, if you know what I mean. And there are shit parts of every job. like. You should see some of the emails I get at council. Like, to the, seriously, I had no idea how much people cared about their parking. Like, it is like holy grail stuff. And so I guess to an, sometimes I could like, you know, you've got the choice. You go, well, either I can like deal with these sanctimonious people and, you know, protect their bizarre sense of entitlement to public space for their own private storage or I can just ignore them and find somebody else who, you know, has a better opinion. So I think you just have have a choice, maybe. Yeah. The guy up the back. You just wanted a t-shirt, didn't you? Oh. It hasn't. Oh, sorry. Has grow at local been done at other TEDs? Um, I think at a couple in New Zealand. So there's, I have no sense of proprietary ownership over the idea. It's one of those things like if you wanted to do a grow it local thing next week, go for it. Um, I think there are a couple in yeah New Zealand. I think maybe Auckland and Christchurch tried something similar. Um, there are kind of there have been variations of that theme where down in Melbourne we put in like a massive veggie patch out the front of. Um, Melbourne Town Hall and ran a whole lot of just bizarre workshops and spectacles. Like, I think we had Costa there doing 80s gardening aerobics just because I just really wanted to. Hey, like, there was, but it worked because, you know, if you want to get people interested in what was happening with the space and, and, and interested in, in food production and stuff like that. Often just giving people an excuse to talk to one another is a really powerful motivator. So if they're like, if Costa there and we're all there like in weird fluoro, just like, you know, shoveling, <laughs> of course you're gonna look at the person next to you and be like, are they for real? And how wonderful, you've just had a conversation. I think that's one of the biggest challenges in, in cities, especially where people are so densely packed in that finding those little opportunities or excuses just to talk to one another are really powerful. 
Um, and if that means humiliating yourself, then so be it, I guess. So, yeah. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, um, do I feel as though there's a, a shift in where things are at? Um, yeah, I think so. And I think it goes back again to the idea of entropy where if there's too much energy in one part of the system, it has to restore itself. And I guess the most important self-regulating system that we all participate in is like the earth in a way. So um, it will either be our choice to proactively address that or to respond to it through climate adaptation, which I think is happening already. But, um, you know, through a lot of the work that we do with the 2020 vision, like we're noticing things like the urban heat island effect in cities where things and infrastructure get so hot in summer that the system starts to go into collapse. So, um, you know, rail infrastructure gets so hot that it melts and that disrupts public transport and that costs money. Or um, the buildings get so hot that people, particularly old people and young people, um, are presenting more and more to hospitals. So whether or not it's by choice or whether it's by force, I think things are having to shift um, because the system is, is trying to correct itself somehow. Um, I think, you know, with, with West Connects in particular, the last, I mean, we've been banging on about it for ages, but as it becomes more apparent that this will affect more people, particularly in the North Shore and in the Western suburbs, there are little groups that are cropping up and, you know, collectively they have a big impact. So, yeah, I think so. But then it, things also shift in the other way as well. Like you see a lot of, like Trump is like, whoa, but how do you explain that? It's like, you know, if you're thinking like, if you think that entropy just makes things better, like, you know, you have to also um, appreciate that finding our lowest potential energy is death. So, sorry, I didn't put that in there because I thought it was a bit dark, but there you go. Uh, yeah? I've got a similar question to that. Yeah. Um, everyone rustling up their old key cups and buying new ones. And then after a few weeks, you kind of forget to bring your key cup and you go back to your bad off way to buy disposable. So, how do you keep up that momentum given that there's just a handful of really active, passionate people out there? Do you almost need like a bank of Jess Rollins out there to kind of keep the conversation going and keep seeding ideas so new people can keep up? Because that's just what I find is that things kind of stop after a while. And we all go, we all forget, we kind of get comfortable with it. What do you think? Yeah, so the question is, um, I'll just paraphrase you, like, how do you maintain momentum or how do you ensure that people are, that it's not just flash in the pan, oh, that was cool and trendy and now let's just go back to what we used to do. Um, I think, oh, yeah, like, Grow It Local just exists now. Like, I don't have time to really do anything with it, but... I also appreciate that it served really well at a particular point in time and it probably catalyzed a whole bunch of other things that I don't even know about. So this whole idea that you have to just keep at it and keep pestering um, is kind of, it's exhausting. And I think if you, like, if you, if you, I mean, it's the environmental movement on the whole, I suppose, like, its lack of adaptability has meant that we still, you know, we're still fighting the same fights that we were 50 years ago. Like, you know, every NGO's mission should be to kind of do itself out of a job. And if they haven't, then you're like, why am I still giving you money? You haven't fixed it. Like, come on, why don't I give it to somebody else to try? So, yeah, I think, I mean, it's just appreciating that things change and some things, sometimes things are better. I think the keep cup stuff, 
it was a really important, like there's um, BJ Fogg's kind of theory of change as well. So there's three elements that have to work at the same time. Or what he says is that you, ha you need motivation, ability and triggers at the same time. So the war and waste motivated people to do something. Um, the triggers will be the constant reinforcements from like cafes to be like, bring it, bring it, bring it. And then what was the other one? Motivation and ability. And the ability is like that great cafe down in Melbourne that's like, if you forget your keep cup and you didn't bring it, they have like a lost mug wall. So you can just grab a mug off the wall and bring it back the next day. So I think there are tricks and, and, and ways that you can sustain the change. But if the, the change is not sustainable, it won't work. And in those circumstances, then maybe it's something a little bit more serious, like chronic heat wave or death or destruction that will finally get people to do something differently. Yep. Just, um, in that context, and just broadly with your research for this, I wanted to ask you about power. Um, oh, yeah. So I think you can talk about inequality without talking about power, and who has it. So what interests me is you've worked at the community local level, now you're working in council at mm. a political level, um, where do you feel more power? And particularly from a gender perspective, because I feel like we live in a time where um, people are scared to go into politics, mm. particularly people from different backgrounds, like sort of more marginalised communities. Where does power really sit for you? Where do you uh. feel the most change? And how does that flick back to sort of inequality, I suppose? Okay. So the question is, um, do, do I feel more power within or outside of the system? Yes. Yeah. And also, do you think it's a system? And do I think it's important to be in the system? Oh, that's a doozy. <laughs> this is being recorded, isn't it? <laughs> um, you can edit that thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> inside, outside. I feel, uh, when you're outside of the system, I think you have a lot more dexterity and a lot more, um, does, you can be more creative. Like I think what I realise working inside the system is that, so like, I guess it, again, it goes back to entropy, right? Like, so if you have a village, um, you don't need a government because people can self-organise and it's a small, relatively uncomplicated system. But when you're dealing with a city of, with 200,000 residents and another 2 million people coming into it every day, you've got, you've got layers upon layers upon layers of systems that need to be navigated and need to, and the, the level of complexity is through the roof. And I think that's the thing that I've realised being on the inside is just how complicated um, the system actually is. So I would be lying if I thought that there was more power, like either way, it's kind of just very different. I think, to be honest, I think you have to be more creative inside the system because you have to figure out how it really works. And there are so many layers, whereas when you're on the outside, you can just make it up yourself. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've got to go. Sorry. Thank you.